Welcome back guys. In this video, let's begin with a new chapter that is respiratory physiology. Let's begin the respiratory physiology with the very important law that's Boyle's law. Boyle's law. Though this Boyle's law is going to be helpful for us in the topic of mechanics of breathing, how air goes in and air comes out. But I want you to know in the beginning of the chapter itself, what exactly is this Boyle's law? Boyle's law states us volume and pressure are inversely proportional. What does I mean by if you increase the volume, pressure decreases or vice versa. If you decrease the volume, pressure increases. Okay, there is inverse relationship between the volume and pressure. To understand this, let's imagine a balloon. Okay, balloon which is inflated to certain volume. Now with your hands, try to decrease the volume of this balloon. Okay, you have taken a balloon, you have inflated it and you have tied a knot. Now you have you are having a balloon in your hands. Now take this balloon, try to decrease the volume of the balloon by compressing it. Automatically you can experience by yourself the pressure inside the balloon will increase. You are trying to compress it, compress it, compress it. What exactly are you doing? You are decreasing the volume of the balloon. So inside the balloon pressure increases. So you are compressing it too much, there will be excessive pressure getting developed inside the balloon. There will be a moment it will pop out. So with this balloon example you can simply understand if you decrease the volume pressure inside the balloon increases. In the same way if you increase the volume of the balloon the pressure inside the balloon will decrease. Okay. After this, let's discuss about Weibull's airway generations. What exactly are these Weibull's gen uh, airway generations? Guys, please see here. In this image, I am showing you Weibull's airway generations. We can simply say these are airway segments. In this image, it's very clear starting from trachea to the alveolus, there are many segments. Please concentrate here guys. See here is a trachea. Trachea was given generation 0 or zone 0. After that, there is generation 1, 2, 3, 4, just like that. There are 23 generations. So, how many generations are there? Weibull gen airway generations number is 23. So, generation 0, generation 0 is trachea. Okay. And the last generation, generation 23 is alveoli. Okay. Or alveolar sacs, I should say. Now, what are the important points which you need to know for your exam? Let's take one by one. The first 16 generations. The first 16 generations, see here. These first 16 generations, they are called as conducting zone. First 16 generations are called as conducting zone. Now, why we are calling the first 16 generations as conducting zone? Why? Because the first 16 generations, okay, this area, first 16 generations, they are only involved in the transfer of the air. There is a no exchange of gases happening, okay. In the first 16 zones, air is simply passing down to the alveolus, but there is no exchange of the air. Okay, that's a key point. So, what is the importance of conducting zone? Conducting zone, there is no gaseous exchange. Okay, there is no gaseous exchange. They are from generation 0 to generation 16. Now, what are the other important points which you need to keep in mind? Guys, as there is no gaseous exchange, we can call this space as dead space dead space 
okay and the ventilation in this area is called as dead space ventilation now what will be the volume of this dead space how much air is going to rest or how much air is going to be present in this first 16 zones it is almost 150 ml of air so we all know with every breath 500 ml of air is going to enter into our lungs in that 500 ml 150 ml is going to stay in the conducting zone itself there is no gases exchange happening so that space where there is no exchange is called as a dead space and the dead space volume is almost 150 ml okay this is the dead space volume now after this let's talk about the generations below 16 that is the last seven generation is 17 18 19 20 21 22 23 the last seven generations are called as let's write down here guys the last 17 generations sorry seven generations are called as last seven generations these last seven generations they are called as respiratory zone Why they are called as respiratory zone? Why? Because their exchange of gases will take place. Gaseous exchange. Okay. Now this respiratory zone it includes which structures? It includes. Please concentrate, guys. Here it includes respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts. And alveolar sacs. Okay, so respiratory zone includes respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. Now, all these three together called as Acinus. Okay, so acinus includes which structures, guys? Respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs, where the exchange of gases is happening. Now, in your exam, questions can be asked something like this: Generation zero is trachea. Generation number twenty-three is alveolar sacs. Respiratory zone starts with, see the respiratory zone is starting with respiratory bronchioles and in the same way conducting zone ends with, conducting zone is ending with terminal bronchioles. So there is a transitional area in between but that's not that important. Terminal bronchioles is the ending point for the conducting zone. And respiratory bronchioles are the starting point for the exchange zone that is a respiratory zone. Now, after knowing this, let's discuss about a few important points about conducting zone. Conducting zone, I have taught you, it's ending with, let's take a point here, it ends with terminal bronchioles. Now, here in this image, I am showing you the terminal bronchial. Whatever I am showing you here, this is a terminal bronchial. Now, what is the importance? See, guys, please concentrate. The terminal bronchioles, they are having lots and lots of smooth muscles which are surrounding them. So, terminal bronchioles are having maximum smooth, smooth muscles in the respiratory tree. A maximum amount of smooth muscles are present around the respiratory bronchioles. As they have the smooth muscles, they can undergo bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation. Okay. So, bronchoconstriction or bronchodilation can be done by the smooth muscles around the terminal bronchioles. Now, after this, you need to know one more important point. If they ask you which are the following bronchioles, 
mainly regulate the airway resistance. Airway resistance is mainly regulated by terminal bronchioles. Why? Because they have maximum amount of smooth muscles. Regulate airway resistance. Okay. Now, let's talk a few more important points about the smooth muscles. Which are present on the terminal bronchioles. Now, whenever the smooth muscles contract, that will cause bronchoconstriction. Whenever the smooth muscles are relaxed, that will cause bronchodilation. For that, there should be receptors, right? Now, these smooth muscles are having beta 2 adrenergic receptors, as well as the smooth muscles are also having M3 muscarinic receptors. Okay. Now, whenever you stimulate this beta 2 adrenergic receptors or sympathetic receptors, there will be bronchoconstriction, sorry, bronchodilation. There will be bronchodilation. Or whenever you stimulate M3 muscarinic receptors or even histamine receptors will be present here. Okay, whenever you stimulate the histamine receptors or leukotriene receptors or uh, parasympathetic receptors, there will be bronchodilation. Uh, bronchoconstriction that's a parasympathetic activity so smooth muscles are having two types of receptors what are they one is beta 2 adrenergic or the sympathetic receptor is there m3 parasympathetic receptor is present on the bronchial smooth muscles now after this let's see some important pathocorrelations here okay let's try to integrate patho Now, after knowing about the smooth muscles, let us discuss a few points about asthma. We all know that in the condition of asthma, there is reversible bronchoconstriction. Bronchus is going to undergo constriction, especially the terminal bronchioles are undergoing constriction. Why this will happen? First of all, asthma is an example of type 1 hypersensitive reaction or anaphylaxis bronchial asthma. Now, what happens in this asthma? Very simple guys. First of all, there are these pollen or dust particles present. Okay. For the first time, when the pollen or dust particles enters into the body. Okay, via nose, the pollen or the dust particles have entered into the body. Now, this person is susceptible. Okay. Now, this, now this won't happen in each and every person. So, genetically predisposed persons now, whenever the pollen enters into their body, their immune system recognizes this pollen or dust particles as antigens. Now, immune system is going to produce antibodies. Okay. Now, in the body of this person, there are antibodies against the pollen. Now, these antibodies they are placed onto the mast cells. These antibodies now are prepared and now where they are guys? They are present on the, they are sitting on the mast cells. First of all, which antibodies are these? These are IgE antibodies. Okay, these are IgE antibodies. Now where they are coming and sitting? Now these IgE antibodies are sitting on the surface of mast cells. Now, these mast cells are present in multiple places. Also, they are present in the respiratory tree also. Now, what will happen? Now, if the pollen, if they again enter into the body for the second time. Now, this pollen, they have entered into the respiratory tract. Now, this pollen, what it will do? These are the, ant there are already antibodies, right? There are already antibodies which are produced against the pollen. Now, this pollen can come and bind with the antibodies now this pollen can cross link pollen can cross link the antibodies so what will happen now these mast cells are going to be activated now they will undergo degranulation okay now what does i mean by degranulation already preformed histamine and inflammatory mediators are present inside the mast cell Whenever the mast cells are irritated or activated, they will immediately release histamine. 
So what this histamine will do? Yes, histamine is a bronchoconstrictor. Okay, so bronchoconstriction will happen. Why bronchoconstriction will happen in a patient who is suffering with bronchial asthma? It's because of the degranulation of histamine from the mast cells. Okay, now let's discuss some important single liners. Yes, histamine causes bronchoconstriction, there is no doubt. But if someone comes to you and asks you, what is the most potent bronchoconstrictor? Is it histamine? Is it prostaglandin? Or is it leukotriene? Which one? It's a leukotriene. Okay, LTV4 especially leukotrienes are the most important bronchoconstrictors. Okay, even the mast cell will also release leukotrienes after some time. After histamine, leukotrienes will also be released from the mast cells. Now, seeing this, let's try to treat the condition of asthma. Okay, just some important correlations. Let's understand that this is bronchus. Okay, here I am showing you bronchus. Now, this bronchus, it's having maximum amount of, especially terminal bronchioles, it's having maximum amount of smooth muscles. I have taught you on the surface of this terminal bronchioles or the smooth muscles, there is beta 2 receptor and also there is M3 receptor, there is histamine receptor and also there is leukotriene receptor. M3 receptor, histamine receptor and leukotriene receptor, whenever they are stimulated, they will cause bronchoconstriction. Whenever beta 2 receptor is stimulated, that will cause bronchodilation. Now, how to treat the condition of bronchial asthma? Very simple. In the condition of bronchial asthma, there is bronchoconstriction. What you have to do as a good doctor, you have to do bronchodilation. But doing bronchodilation, should you have to stimulate beta 2 receptors or should you have to stimulate M3 muscarinic receptors? You have to stimulate beta 2 receptors. What are the beta 2 agonists or what are the beta 2 stimulants? Including sal, buta, mol. For me terol ter buta lean okay ter buta lean okay salbutamol for uh, for meterol terbutalin terbutalin all these are the beta 2 stimulants which will cause bronchodilation in the same way you have to inhibit the m3 receptors you have to inhibit the histamine receptors or you should inhibit the leukotriene production or you should inhibit the leukotriene receptors. Now, what are the drugs which will cause inhibition of M3 receptors? Now, M3 blockers include protropium, thio, tropium. Iprotropium and thiotropium are the M3 blockers. Now, you have, I have taught you the leukotriene receptors, okay, the leukotrienes are the most important or the potent bronchoconstrictors. So, you have to block the leukotriene receptors also. What are the examples? Montelukast, Zafirlukast. You can see in the name itself it is there. Okay, see so leukast, L-E-U-K-S-T, leukast, leukast means leukotriene antagonist, okay, leukotriene receptor blockers. Now, after this, let's talk about a few more important drugs which are used in the treatment of asthma. Those drugs include zelutoin, okay, now what is this zelutoin is going to? do and help in treatment of asthma. The name itself, it's a leu. What is this leu for? Leukotriene. 
leukotriene receptor blocker? No. Zilutamon is a drug which will inhibit. Inhibit 5 lipooxygenase pathway. Whenever lipooxygenase pathway is not happening, whenever there is no lipooxygenase pathway, leukotrienes are not produced. Whenever there is no leukotriene, there is no bronchoconstriction. So, zeluton is a drug which will inhibit 5 lipooxygenase pathway and leukotrienes are not produced in the body. That will treat the asthma. Also, we have studied about mashed cells. Mashed cells are the ones which degranulate and immediately release the histamine. That histamine will act on the bronchial smooth muscle causing the bronchoconstriction. So, what type of drug we have to do? We have to inhibit the mashed cells or we have to make the mast cells to go into sleep. That is a mast cell stabilization. So, the drugs like mast cell stabilizers. Mast cell stabilizers are also used in the treatment of asthma. The drugs include sodium, chromo, glycate. Okay, so sodium chromoglycate is a drug which is a mast cell stabilizer. And at the end of the day, we have discussed that IgE antibodies are present on the mast cells. IgE antibodies are the ones responsible for the asthma. IgE antibody cross-linking will activate the mast cells. When mast cells are activated, histamine is there that causes bronchoconstriction and asthma. So, we have developed a drug called as omalizumab. Now, what kind of drug is omalizumab? It's a MAB, means monoclonal antibody, which is anti-IgE. It is anti-IgE antibody. These antibodies are going to attack the IgE antibodies so that IgE antibodies are blocked and they are not getting placed on the they are not getting placed on the mast cells so that there is no activation of the mast cells. Okay, so there are some important drugs which are used in the treatment of asthma. Now, after this, let's discuss about conducting soap.